Welcome to Trending in Education. This is Mike Palmer, back home safe in Brooklyn. It's early March, 2022. We're now officially two years in to the global phenomenon known as the coronavirus pandemic. A lot of us are reflecting back over the last couple of years, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to bring back some of the sound from the episodes we released in 2020. We wound up doing 102 shows in 2020, and there was a bit of a flurry of activity in March of that year. Even prior to March, we, as a trend spotting show, were tracking this virus activity that started in Wuhan, China, and ultimately tracked it right through the cancellation of South by Southwest EDU that year, where we were planning to do a live taping of Trending and Ed down there. We just now did successfully do our live taping of Trending and Ed down at South by Southwest EDU. More to come on that in upcoming episodes was a really amazing trip. But right now, the zeitgeist is very much looking back two years. And we thought this was a good time for us to do that as well. Later, you'll hear clips from episodes with Brian Alexander, the noted futurist who looks at higher ed and was contemplating the impact of a pandemic from very early stages and then was integral in some of the immediate response in terms of tracking the impact of the pandemic at higher ed universities across the U.S., and then we'll have a little more sound at the end with Angela Seifer, who's the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, digitalinclusion.org. Had Angela on a few times. This was right in the thick of the first wave of the pandemic. We'll get you some of that sound through the rest of this episode. I'm going to begin here with some sound from an episode I recorded with Dan Strafford back I looked like it was February 10th of 2020, so relatively early. We did one other episode prior to this, and this was a bit of a follow-up where we touched on the coronavirus, but we didn't really go deep. Uh, just give you a taste of it. We'll share this episode in the show notes for folks who might be interested. It is a, an interesting time to go back a couple years and reflect on really everything that's gone on. And we do have the opportunity of having some original audio footage from that time. So let's take us back, Dan Strafford and myself talking about the coronavirus back in February of 2020. Welcome back to Trending in Education. Dan Strafford, Mike Palmer with you. And we follow up on a previous episode where we talked about all the things happening in the world. And Mike, we mentioned one, but we, we never really got to it, the coronavirus. So we wanted to talk about that and, and a follow up on, on that episode about all of the, the different things, but always like to check in first. How are you doing and how are you feeling? I know you're a little yeah. under the weather. I am. And, uh, you know, a little interesting tidbit. So we did a little research for, for this show. Interesting tidbit is that the common cold is a form of the coronavirus. It was discovered back in the 1960s. There's two forms of the common cold. This cold feels uncommon because it's been a little bit brutal, but I imagine I'm suffering from an old school coronavirus that's not that bad. But the new school coronavirus was just discovered and it was identified by the World Health Organization on December 31st, 2019. So it's like the 2020s are coming. We want to bring it in with with a, a big, big explosion. Right. Ryan explosion. Seacrest, yeah. Dick Clark, and yeah. the coronavirus. Coronavirus. So there's a new variant of the coronavirus that was uh, discovered in the Wuhan province of China. And uh, it has been spreading. So like it has spread uh, to... Last, I don't know if it made it to Africa or South America yet, but I think it made it to the other continents so far. And people are very up in arms and it kind of feeds into that same collective sentiment of fear and panic and the idea that we're living in this sort of dystopian sci-fi future. And there's an element of truth to that. 
So, uh, so I'm feeling okay. You know, I'm on the better side of bad. I got my lozenge game together. I got my hot liquid game together. Things are looking up for this guy. There you go. And to your point about sci-fi and this sort of dystopian future, you do see they're almost locking down portions of China, the Wuhan province specifically, but also I think 50,000 flights have been canceled that fly into China. Now you take that along with the socioeconomic uh, things that go on between places like the United States, yeah. United Kingdom and China and relations there, add this on top of it. Right. And it does become an, also an interesting lens with which to look through worldviews, uh, race views, uh, sort of uh, xenophobia and how that can feed in. Uh, oh. There are all sorts of things at play here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it's, we are living in interesting times, you know, and this is the type of thing that argues uh, against globalism. If you have closed borders, viruses don't move, but also information and solutions also don't move. You know, the people who need to be in different parts of the world can't get there as easily when, when folks start to lock down. And then particularly because many of these viruses are identified by where they began, I think it can feed into racism and xenophobia uh, especially in this case in the U.S., there will be increased fear vaguely warranted around people who have been in China. You know, so it's pretty interesting to think about the scope of the risk. You know, it's a relatively severe uh, virus. So I, I think it had a fatality rate of 3% the last I saw. So, you know, a 97% chance of not dying if you do contract this. But, you know, 3% is kind of big. But compared to, say, like the flu or the common cold, you know, I think the sci-fi element is that if you can't contain these things, they can really spread depending on how contagious they are. So, so yes, it's, it's interesting. We were talking about how it's going viral, how the coronavirus is going coronaviral. There, there is, again, talking about the science, like there there's a lot to learn around virology, and I did dip my toe in the pool a little bit as preparation for this, but, but the science there is interesting, and I think it's something that we will want to, want to circle back to, both virology and epidemiology. So, like, virology is, like, you know, the nature of the virus, how they change, how do we, how do we develop vaccines and defenses for them on the one hand, and then epidemiology on the other hand, which is, you know, more of like the social science side of how things spread, you know, just like when you go viral, it's on social media, epidemiology, you know, the way diseases are contracted and spread is through, you know, generally social uh, contact, you know, some kind of contact. And what's funny, you know, it's all like, uh, Rob, I think it was Robert Fulgram back in the day, everything I needed to know, I learned in kindergarten, but it does feel like a lot of this stuff is taking us back there. You know, like the the tragedy around Kobe is is saying like, you know, hold your family close and, and really value that. And, you know, the, the dad girl craze, even the impeachment trial, I think a lot of people are frankly happy it's done and, you know, are almost thinking again about the importance of kindness and like sort of a, a reaction against how nasty things have gotten. And then the coronavirus, I think the takeaway is sneeze into your elbow, wash, wash your, your wash hands, your you know? And it's like, you know, have your cookies and take a nap, you know, like these things all seem obvious, honestly. And then somehow we lose, we lose our way over the years. Yeah. Slow down, you know, slow down a little bit, wash those hands regularly and make sure you're uh, the phrase I keep uh, hearing is good hand hygiene. So yes. it's washing hands, 20 seconds, making sure, you know, you hear sing the alphabet, sing Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star, whatever you want to do to count out those 20 seconds, yeah. uh, but give yourself some time to do that. And uh, to your point, kindergarten, first grade, like that's what the teachers are. Hey, don't forget, wash your hands, get back, get back there and wash those hands. So yeah. I think it makes total sense. And you are seeing sci-fi or, or maybe the hysterics of it all that can happen. I may mention when we talked last week before we recorded, I was at my local pharmacy and they had sold out of masks two days in a row, surgical masks that you see people walking around. And largely from what you read and talking to my own doctor and my wife's doctor, they're not going to do much. A surgical mask isn't going to change 
uh, your interactions because it's on your hands, right? If you're shaking well, hands. It, it can keep, like, it's on your right, hands. If, if it's stopping your hands, yes. Your that hands is true. don't go to your mouth. So, like, I, I think the surgical masks, we don't want to – we don't want to inspire a, a run on surgical masks. For, we don't want to have a panic to go with the right. pandemic. But, uh, but I do believe the surgical mask, as far as I can tell, would help. It's just a, it's a, it's a little bit of weak tea. You know, it's like, unless you're in a high, high percentage of incidents, like they're, they're, if you're in a high risk area where there's a lot of cases that have already been cited. Or an like, EMT or a doctor. Yeah, or... exactly. You work in a hospital, or you work in an ER. You know, uh, you work in an ER in the Wuhan Peninsula. You know, you probably should be wearing a surgical mask right now. The other thing that was fascinating is how quickly China stood up a 10,000 bed hospital. I think they did that within a couple of weeks. You know, hospital in air quotes, you know, because I don't know how up to code that that building is. And then I don't know what's, what's, what's really interesting and zeitgeisty and frightening at the same time about this is the idea of quarantine and sort of, you know, othering the people who have the problem and solving it for the rest of us by putting them in a separate place. And I, I think it is an interesting thing to continue to watch. As, as you mentioned, like the impact on the global economy is really interesting because the other aspect of of all of this is trade and commerce and things that expect the free flow of humans and capital and goods around around the world. And uh, China's a huge economy. And, and if this turns into something that's as big as it may be, it's definitely worth noting. But it's also worth noting that, you know, SARS was similar, MERS was similar. We've seen a good number of these like super viruses. Right. Well, we had the avian flu and the swine flu and, yeah. and those swine flu took, had a number of fatalities, which I don't remember happening at the time. Worldwide was a pretty large number. I will point out also the, the, the first doctor to sort of raise the alarm bells around this virus, the coronavirus in Wuhan has passed away, a 33-year-old ophthalmologist who was one of the first to say something doesn't seem right with this. It seems a little bit off. He claimed to have been not really listened to, which would have, would seem to be the case now as it has spread. Uh, yeah. But he passed away recently over the past couple of days, which has been another reminder to people there. And I think worldwide about, you know, he was the first to say something about it and now has passed away himself. So taking this seriously, you know, the hand washing, the mask, whatever it may be, but from a government perspective, a doctor perspective, it is a serious thing. We can sometimes lose sight of that. But to your point, if it's not contained, we assume now it will be just right. science and the way things work. But if it were not to be contained, it is dangerous and it is something that could cause some problems. So that's what you were hearing on Trending in Ed back in February of 2020. Not bad, although I got to tell you, there's plenty of wince-worthy, cringe-worthy sound from me uh, and perhaps a bit from Dan in that conversation. One problem with recording yourself is that it's on the record and you have to listen to it again in the future. The future is now. Two years have passed and, you know, the concept of dramatic irony definitely comes to mind here as well. When I hear myself and Dan talking back in... February of 2020, I want to shout through time some warnings and some perspective, but that's the whole idea. We, as the audience, we know more, and that's really going to be the case throughout this episode. We're going to fast forward now to an episode that was recorded, looks like March 16th, based on my records, with Brian Alexander, the noted higher ed futurist. Brian's been on the show several times, and I was very fortunate to get him on a few times in early 2020. Brian recently, at the time, had written his book, Academia Next, in which one of the things he contemplated, one possible future he explored, was a pandemic, contemplating what might have been the impact of a pandemic. Had him on a couple months prior, and then what was happening in uh, China had spread. Even what you heard from me and Dan in February was really when we were hoping 
The virus may have been contained, much like Ebola had been mostly contained before it did spread, although you did hear me talking about how it had reached five continents at the time. We'll pick up here with the beginning of my episode with Brian. Credit to him and to the type of content that you get here at Trending in Ed. This conversation still holds up, and this was March 16th of 2020. Have a listen. Welcome to Trending in Education. Really happy to have Brian Alexander back uh, by both popular demand and perhaps unfortunate circumstance. Brian was, uh, was a wonderful guest for us. He's a futurist, looks at higher education. We talked about his book, Academia Next, uh, about a month ago, which uh, has gotten really great update. And Brian's a great resource for folks who want to understand what's, what's coming, particularly in higher education, but just also more broadly uh, in the world around us. And unfortunately, one of the things that is hitting, uh, hitting us all in many different ways is the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. And Brian has become a really critical resource for folks who want to understand what's emerging, what's happening there. So, so Brian, welcome back to Trending in Education. Well, thank you, Mike. It's great to be back. I really enjoyed our last talk and I'm glad to be here now. Yeah. And, you know, there's the, the old, the curse, you know, living in interesting times. It does appear as though we are living in interesting times. The, this virus is a serious thing. It does look like it is global in its reach and its impact is broad, you know, hitting closest to home. We're, I'm not in Austin this week. I am at home in Brooklyn because uh, South by Southwest was canceled. You've been making the, the news and the media lately in terms of how you're tracking the impact to higher education of this virus. I'd love to, to hear a little bit from you about what you've been doing, what you're seeing, and how you've become really a critical curator of information for folks who, who want to understand what's happening uh, as far as the coronavirus and its impact on higher ed. Well, sure. It's a great question. I was, to back up a little bit, people in the futurist community have long been interested in viruses and disease, biological disasters. These are things that we've been planning on, simulating gaming for a long, long time. And we could talk about some of those if you like. So when COVID-19 started to burst out in January, I started tracking it carefully. And I gradually built up a simple blog post of just what I thought were the best resources for following the virus. And this became very popular and now it gets thousands of hits a day. People really like it. So I've just got, you know, a, a few brilliant Twitter people to follow there, uh, a few open access scholarly journals that have material that we can use, some generally available information and that kind of thing, along with some dashboards. And so this is pretty useful. And then I started scoping out how this could hit higher education. Ironically, uh, my book, Academia Next, uh, in 2019, when I gave it to the publisher, I have two passages where I talked about the possible impact of a plague on higher education. And so, you know, I'm sad that those are ones that came true. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I was following this closely and thinking about it and then started tracking how this is impacting higher ed. And it, Chronicle Higher Ed was doing this on a case-by-case basis. Uh, Inside Higher Ed was doing this, roundups. And I thought, well, let's just have a spreadsheet where we track all the different institutional responses. And some of these schools are closing or canceling classes. Some of them are moving everything online. So I just went to Google apps, set up a Google spreadsheet, quickly sketched out a few columns and said, okay, friends, you know, put it on Twitter. What do you think? What are we missing? It started off with about uh, five or six starting University of Washington, Seattle, mm -hmm. canceled classes and went online. And then it just grew uh, when Stanford canceled classes and then more and more schools around Seattle. And that it's been growing ever since. And by growing, I mean, not just that the stories are growing as more and more campuses are considering closing and shunting everything online, but that more and more people have been adding data to it. It's, it's an open document. So people mm. have been adding individual stories. They've been adding information. And then a few great people from Ithaca SNR added columns. They uh, plugged it into the iPads database. So that now we have columns, not just for the, the name of the university and what it's doing, but also for its population, its nature, its latitude and longitude. So we generated uh, maps as a result. It's undergraduate headcount and graduate headcount. So now we have a running total how many students are impacted. Mm -hmm. And it's just been growing like mad. Inside of Higher Ed started pointing to it. NPR pointed to it. They interviewed me about it. Times of London Education interviewed me about it. 
and a few others. It's it's just really been uh, very rich and very exciting to see. A few times we had problems loading it, and I think we may have exceeded Google Apps's uh, cloud provisioning for it. Right. It's pretty solid now. So yeah. those, are the, those are the two things. Uh, the spreadsheet and the blog post have been getting a lot of attention. And they're, yeah. It's a kind of classic example of light web 2.0 technology being used for collaborative information sharing. Yeah. And if, just for our listeners, if they do want to track that stuff down, where 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 do they find the blog? Where do they find the, the spreadsheet? Well, if you just go to uh, my blog, rhinoalexander.org, uh, I've got a little post pinned to the top, which has links to both of those. Okay. Awesome. And on our previous conversation, we started talking about science fiction maybe later than I wanted. So I made a memo to myself to make sure I brought up science fiction early enough because because you lit up and and I think I also lit up in response to <laughs> what you were putting out there. Science fiction, much like futurists, and we talked about how they're they're interrelated, has explored the idea of plagues and biological disasters and and the like. I'd love to get your perspective on what you've encountered within science fiction and how you can learn from some of these examples on the one hand, and then any uh, recommendations for folks who want to maybe enjoy a little bit of edutainment while, while leaning into some of the paranoia that is, uh, is upon us. Uh, <laughs> any thoughts on, on either of those ideas? Sure. Let's, let's toss some examples back and forth. Do you want me to go back in time or do we pick recent examples? Maybe going back in time and then, and then we can hop around from there. Okay, so people often call Mary Shelley the, the grandmother of science fiction because of Frankenstein, mm -hmm. which they should. It's a great book. It's not the first one, but it's, it's definitely a, a lodestar. And it's pretty amazing. Well, late in her career, she wrote a novel called The Last Man, mm -hmm. which is about a plague that wipes out the human race. Uh, it's a much longer book. It's uh, very, very, very detailed. Uh, and it starts off as basically her, I think, the author's way of processing different people that she lost in life, including mm. her husband, including Byron, including her father. Yeah. And then about a third of the way into the book, a plague breaks out in Constantinople. And it just spreads until it exterminates the human race. I mean, it's an epic Gothic book. And it's not as well known, but during the 80s, when the AIDS crisis broke out, it became uh, pretty popular. Mm. A century later, uh, the great, great uh, underappreciated Olaf Stapledon has this mind-blowing book called Last and First Men, which is the, one of the first great future histories where it looks at the human race over the next several million years. And several times he wipes out the human race by, by plague. Right. Um, so I, I think it, just before Stapledon, H.G. Wells toyed the plagues more often than not. Uh, the more of the worlds, the Martians come, they bring their own diseases. And they, of course, fell by disease. Right. So I, I, I think there's a long history of that. Yeah, and I think you were helping me formulate my thinking around this when we talked last, but but science fiction is actually a really critical tool in terms of our mental preparedness and our imaginative ability in in much the way that being a you know, being future a futurist, someone who's thinking about what's emerging requires similar skills. I'd love to hear more of your thinking around what can be learned from the science fiction? What can be learned from, you know, being imaginative about what might happen? You know, you talked about possible yeah. futures rather than a yeah. single one. Can you take a step back and maybe just reflect a little bit on that? And then I'd love to drill in a little further into sure. the coronavirus itself. Sure. And I want to give a couple of more examples of, uh, of science fiction. Yeah, great. Things. But I, I think one of the things it does is it, it gives us the power to imagine ourselves in a different setting. Either explicitly, I mean, a lot of futures work works that way. It says, hey, here's a scenario, and you can imagine yourself in the future, in the year 2050, if X and Y happen. And science fiction does that implicitly, where you see characters go through journeys and you get to follow them. And so that's that can teach you about yourself. That can also give you insight into how humans respond. So, I mean, to the extent that uh, artists are giving you depictions of humanity, you get to imagine uh, ways in which humans can respond to disease like mm -hmm. through science, through chaos, through religion and so on. And so I, I think these are very, very powerful. When, when it comes to the future side, and we often do exercises, simulations or games, and that gives us a good way to test out our responses to find flaws and uh, cracks in our plans. And so that's extremely useful. In fact, I have a blog post pointing to uh, a few different exercises people have done. There was one called uh, Global 2 
03 that took a look at uh, plagues that came out of Brazil and chewed up most of the, uh, the world. There's a game from the CDC, which lets, it teaches you how to hunt down uh, viral outbreaks, which is mm. pretty clever. It's not easy. It's a, it's a tough little game. Uh, so I, I think those give us the extra ability to test her skills and see how things unfold, uh, you know, in the way that good role play can. Yep. To get a little bit more to the, to the present, I just want to put in a plug for an underrated movie, a Steven Soderbergh movie called Contagion. Have you seen mm -hmm. it? I have. Yep. Oh, yes. That's a, that's a chilly, chilly film. It, mm. it's one of those hard science films that feels almost like a documentary. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's pretty uncanny to watch now. I, I recently rewatched it, in a live tweet experience and it was, it was very unsettling. I mean, there, there are some great high points. I'm not a fan of Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop. So I'm, I'm always glad to see her get killed off really early. Mm -hmm. It was a scene where her brain gets sawed out and I thought this is going to be the ultimate moment of celebrity culture. But, <laughs> but one of the things that it, that's interesting in the, in the film is that the CDC is clearly the heroic force. They're the guiding lights. And in, in our world, in our timeline, if you will, the CDC has fumbled things badly. Yeah. They have fumbled the testing very, very badly. And it's possible that people will suffer and die as a result. Yeah. I, I don't know to what extent that's because of uh, the Trump administration's policies and to what extent the rot comes from further in, but it's, it's very, very upsetting. Great stuff there from Brian, as always. We'll include a link to that episode and give you access to other episodes with Brian over the years. He's definitely someone to continue to track. We're coming up on time for this episode. I wanted to bring one more clip back from 2020 as we look at this retro window. I'm also calling these types of episodes our Pandemoir episodes, working on a memoir of the pandemic. Be on the lookout for more episodes of this nature as we reflect back on what we hope is a two-year period that is now coming to an end. One of the episodes that came out at this time that would have been relevant anyway was about digital inclusion. But when we started to connect the dots between digital inclusion, meaning access to digital tools, we'd had Angela Seifer on the show previously to talk about the work that she was doing at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. I had... Angela back on again. This wound up being one of our most downloaded episodes in 2020, one of our most downloaded episodes of all time, partly because the work that Angela was doing and Angela and team are continuing to do to ensure that everyone has equal access to digital products and services. It was a real mission and meaningful work prior to the pandemic, and then it, it really became much, much more important where people's lives were on the line. Here's a little bit of sound from my interview with Angela at that time. By this point, it was getting a little later in March and some of the rawness of the sound reflects some of the raw emotion and the feeling that we were all going through at that time. Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very happy to be joined again by Angela Seifer, the Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, a topic that's super relevant to the new world order that we're living in, in light of the, the COVID uh, pandemic, COVID-19. Angela, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. I'm excited to join you. So we had a wonderful conversation with you uh, a little while back. Folks should refer back to that conversation. If folks want to learn more about what digital inclusion is, they should go to digitalinclusion.org. And Angela will update us more on some of the new resources that are available through that website and through the organization that she's heading up. But uh, just to get folks caught up who may not know what digital inclusion is, can you give us a, a quick summary of what is digital inclusion? Yeah, sure. So digital inclusion is the activities that would get us to digital equity. So it's important to think about both of the terms. Digital equity is the goal. 
where individuals and communities have access to the information communication technologies that they need to do anything. But then digital inclusion is how we get there. So this is affordable home broadband, it's uh, digital literacy trainings, it's the appropriate devices, it's the right apps. And as you described it, this new world order that we're living in, that looks a lot different than it did just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. One of the, the turns of phrase that I've been hearing a lot and I've been using is how the, the COVID-19 pandemic, the coronavirus, is a forcing function for change, good and bad, most, mostly bad. But one of the, the changes, I think, is just awareness around the criticality of digital access to livelihood, survival, public health. You were talking to me a little bit about that when we were prepping. Uh, could you expand on that a bit? Yes, there's definitely been an increased awareness uh, that if you do not have internet at home, if you do not have a computer at home, because a mobile phone doesn't always cut it, particularly today, if you don't have the digital skills to use those tools, how are you surviving if we are all supposed to be sheltering in place? Mm -hmm. The announcement recently that the health systems can use Medicare to cover telehealth visits that is completely dependent upon those, those patients having an internet connection at home, having a device and being comfortable adding the app that the health system tells them to add. Mm -hmm. Some are ready to do that and some are not. Right. And so the uses for all of us to just survive today, like we could just count them off one by one, right? You can do your banking, you can stay connected to your family, you can work, you can, yeah. you can you know, learn everything. But I think the biggest thing for us to also recognize is the public safety aspect. You do, if, there, if an individual does not have, or a household does not have that connection at home, they're going to leave the house. Right. Right. And we don't want folks leaving the house. Mm -hmm. Either they are going to contract it themselves or they could spread it. Either way, we want folks to stay at home. You have to have an internet connection right. in order to, I mean, there's a small percentage of people who are going to have a great time without an internet connection, but would any of the listeners agree with that? Like, would right. they want to do that? Would you want to be like, oh, it's cool. I'll just read books. <laughs> right. Right. Especially because so much of the solution space now is there are apps. You know, like if I didn't have access to Amazon here in Brooklyn over the last month, I, you know, I, I guess I would have been spending more time at Costco, you know, and, and in the reality yeah, is that you can, in my context, that is, you know, based on some of what I've seen, depending on the Costco you're going to, you know, there's risk you take on everywhere, but we yeah. have, we have the choice to leave the house or not. If you don't have access to digital, you almost have to leave the house. And You've then, lost your, there's no choice. There's no right. choice. And then the interesting thing when we met previously you know, we talked about the critical role that community libraries and other social service delivery venues that are available in communities provide a critical role when it comes to addressing folks who, who are, are in poverty or seniors or just traditionally non-digital humans. You know, you could deliver the training and the coaching and the, the, the sort of shoulder-to-shoulder individualized attention that's needed to help get these folks across the digital divide. Now, in light of the social distancing and sheltering at home that we're facing, it's getting even more complicated. Can you, can you tell us a little, I mean, uh, I don't want to push you too far in this direction, but, you know, we'll come back to how, you know, we really need to inspire hope and understand that there's heroism happening really across the board and just like healthcare workers, folks who are trying to provide digital access right now are saving people's lives. But can you, can you talk about how the, the problem space changed and how the solution space is still maybe being defined? Yeah, so digital inclusion programs, they're all local, right? The work it is inherently local. It tends to be community-based organizations, libraries, housing authorities, the local governments, and they are adjusting their work to be less in person and more via phone yep. um, or online for the folks who are ready for that step. A good example is access to computers. A computer refurbisher was explaining to me the new process that they have instituted for 
picking up machines that will be donated. Those machines are then kept um, in a room for three days and they are cleaned in addition to that. And then when the computers go out, families have 15, they're separated by 15 minutes. And so there is a pickup time. So the refurbisher rolls the computer out on the cart outside the warehouse with the paperwork. The person picking it up knows what time they're supposed to be there. It has their name on it. They sign the paperwork, load it up in their car, and leave the cart. The staff from the warehouse come out, clean the cart. Mm -hmm. I have gloves on at all times, put the paperwork aside to deal with later, and go back in for the next one. Right. So there's, there's this, these new pro and it slows it down because before it would have been like, boom, boom, boom. Right. Now it's only every 15 minutes. And so, and, and not everybody, not all the staff and volunteers are comfortable being in an environment like that, which is totally fair, right? Sure. But those who are doing that work right now, they are saving lives. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I don't feel like I'm overstating that at all, that more folks having internet at home and having a device is going to keep them from going out to have their needs met. Yes. And that is then going to keep this, is going to reduce the spread. On, and on our website, digitalinclusion.org, there's a list of our, there's a map with affiliates. You can find the one that, I mean, now it doesn't have to be one that's closest to you. You could just pick one <laughs> and email them or call them and ask if you can help with the phone support because they are all figuring out how, and they may not have an answer for you right away because they're all figuring out how to do their work mm -hmm. remotely. Right. When, when it was in the whole, it, it, the, even though it's technology, it was, it's very personal mm -hmm. because many of us don't trust technology. So having somebody sit with you to explain it, you got to trust what they're telling you. Right. So, so they are, the digital, local digital inclusion programs are figuring that out right. right now. And with that, we'll bring this look back at two years ago to conclusion. I got to tell you, we're kind of just scratching the surface when you think about the depth of what we captured in real time back in 2020. Be on the lookout for more episodes like this where we try to put the past into perspective to help us understand where we are today so that we can lean into the future. We're going to keep doing it. Let us know what you think. Write us a review. Share the good word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.